Take your copy of God's Word out today. We're going to be in two places. We're going to start off uh, as we have been in Luke chapter 11. And then near the uh, midpoint of our message, we're going to be primarily in uh, Matthew chapter 13. And so those will be the, the two places in uh, God's Word that we'll be looking at this morning. You know, last week, a, a Washington State woman had the internet scratching its head after a Facebook video showed her vacuuming her sidewalk. Some people said, we've seen it all. Another posted, guess she's not heard of a broom before. Someone else wrote, her broom must be in the kitchen standing up all by itself, you know, because, you know, that whole broom challenge thing. Someone joked, she must go through a lot of vacuums. And a few even posted some harsh comments suggesting that maybe she was taking things that she shouldn't be. And as it turned out, there was far more to the lady and the vacuum story. The lady of the video, one Kathy Rodriguez, revealed that she was actually cleaning up glass after a drunk driver had crashed into her van. She simply didn't want to risk anyone getting hurt by stepping on any lingering glass on the sidewalk, so she got out there with her vacuum cleaner, which is just a fancier version of a shop vac after all. So Kathy was paying attention to the details. Details are important. And that's why Jesus was willing to teach the disciples how to pray when they ask. So are you ready to follow the example of Jesus? Are you ready to be like the disciples? Then let's pay attention to the details and learn how to pray and watch our lives and those around us change. So let's ask God to, to bless our time in his word this morning. God, we do thank you for allowing us to be here. We thank you for the rain that we hear gently falling. God, I pray that, uh, that we will focus on what your words have to say for our life today. Help us to pay attention to them and apply them to our lives. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So in the past weeks, we have seen that prayer is about God and, and, and who he is and his greatness but we've also seen that, that prayer is, is about us and our struggles that sometimes keep us from praying. Last week, we learned that prayer is personal because, well, it, it, it's a, it starts with us. It concerns us. And today, we're going to see that prayer is about the kingdom. And so, Scripture tells us this. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, that after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord... Teach us how to pray just as John's disciples were, were taught. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And so what is the kingdom of God? I mean, I mean, we can come up with all sorts of stuff. Sometimes, man, we, we think it's heaven, and sometimes maybe it's more than that. The word kingdom means sovereignty. It means authority. It means royal power. It is the physical place where the king rules, and it is the scope of his influence. So by that definition, we can see that, well, we know that God is in heaven and he is on his throne, so boom, the kingdom of God is heaven, but yet it's also the scope of his power and influence. It's his dominion, right? Well, what is that? Well, that's everywhere when you really think about that. So, Jesus taught that his kingdom was not like those of the world because its place is not geographical and its ways are not established by human means. That's why Jesus' disciples didn't have to take up arms to fight to create the kingdom or to protect the kingdom. And so the kingdom of God is not necessarily a physical place. It's not a, a, a kingdom of physical means. It is so much more beyond all of those things. So what is it? Well, the kingdom is the gospel. All right? Mark writes this. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So the kingdom shows that God is here to help because the word gospel means good news. So the good news, the message of Jesus is 
the kingdom. That brings in, ushers in, it is the kingdom. And so that is what we are to be about. That is what is the kingdom is about. The kingdom of God is about the gospel. And if it's not the gospel, then it's not a part of the kingdom. The kingdom is the rule of Christ in believers. All right, so if the kingdom is authority and it's rule, well, it's about Christ and the authority that he has in the life of believers. All right, so the kingdom might not be physical. It might not have geographical boundaries, but it does because the Bible tells us that in this sense that we are the temple of God, that we are where Christ rules, that that's where his authority is at, and that's why it's so important for us to follow him. Paul writes this, in, in Romans chapter 14, verses 17 and 18, the kingdom isn't a matter of what you put in your stomach. It's what God does with your life as he sets it right, as he puts it together and completes it with joy. Your task is to single-mindedly serve Christ by pleasing the God above you and proving your worth to the people around you. So the kingdom proclaims that God is first in all things. So the kingdom is the gospel. The kingdom is the rule of Christ in our life. That means that he is first in importance, that he is primary, that he is the priority above all things, that that is the emphasis of the kingdom. But the kingdom is also the visible working of God's power. Okay, we have all sorts of symbols that, that symbolize, you know, our, our country and different rules that have happened in the past. But the working of God through Christ is, a, is part of what the kingdom is. Matthew writes this, that Jesus was going through all the cities and villages and he was teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming what again? The gospel, proclaiming the kingdom healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. So the kingdom demonstrates that God is working in all people. So the kingdom lets us know that God is here to help. That is the kingdom of God. The kingdom proclaims that God is first in all things. That is the kingdom of God. The kingdom demonstrates that God is working in people. He's making a difference. That is the kingdom of God. So the parables told by Jesus then describe this nature of the kingdom of God. If he is here to help, if it's about his role and rule and work in our lives, and if it's about what he's able to do in all things around us, then the parables are going to tell us a little bit about what that's like. And so look at this. The kingdom is here. Jesus said this, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. Adding that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed into his field. And it, this the smaller than all other seeds, but when it is fully grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So we can see that the kingdom exists in a world that opposes it. So think about this right now. We live in a world that opposes the kingdom of God, but yet the kingdom of God is here right now. So we see that. But we also see this, that the kingdom is still able to increase and offer benefit. So while the kingdom of God, Jesus' kingdom, is here amongst us, and we as believers are a part of it, and even though there is opposition to the kingdom, because, man, there is evil and wickedness in the land, yes? Even with that, because the kingdom of heaven is like that mustard seed, it grows, it increases, and it grows large, and it offers benefit. The kingdom of God is here. 
But also, I want you to know, the kingdom is unstoppable. I mean, sometimes as Christians, man, we, we get kind of down, because we do. We look at the evil that's in the world, and we think, man, what are we going to do? We've got to do something. We've got to manufacture something. I mean, we've got to rely on other people to make sure that God doesn't get pushed off into a corner. Man, we don't need to do that. It's unstoppable. Look at what Jesus says. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put in only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. And so what we see is, is that the kingdom affects everyone. It affects everything it comes in contact with, and it does so for the better. Because, you know, I mean, I like crackers, but I like me some bread more than I like me some crackers. And you're going to be right there with us, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, when we go make ourselves sandwiches, we don't think about, well, hey, can I put that on a big saltine? No, man, we want a loaf of bread. And when we go, when we go down to school later, we're going to want a roll to go with all that other goodness that we're going to end up having. The kingdom is unstoppable, just like that leaven is in that bread. Just a little bit here, and it's everywhere. So do you see what that's telling us? When Jesus says, your kingdom come, he's talking about the fact that it's here, it's right now, and it's unstoppable. Nothing can contain the kingdom of God. Well, let's keep going then. It's here, it's unstoppable. But I also want you to know that the kingdom, it's desirable. Jesus says this, that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and then hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, verse 45 says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So, we can see that the kingdom of God is valuable to those who consider it. Since they will do anything to get it and give up anything to have it. That's what it means to be a Jesus person, right? I surrender all. You know, his disciples said, Lord, where will we go? We gave up everything for you. Those of you who know Christ, would you want to willingly give up being members of the kingdom? No. I gave my life for it, technically, right? Jesus did. The kingdom is here, and we are a part of it, if you know Jesus. The kingdom is not just here, but it's unstoppable. It's powerful. And that same kingdom is so desirable that we should be willing to give up anything for it and do whatever we can to make sure that we are a part of it. That is the kingdom. That's the kingdom to which you belong. Does it change the way that you look at life? Does it change the way we think about what Jesus is teaching us? Your kingdom come. So what does the kingdom of God then mean to you? The word come here describes a time uh, in relation to a decision, a moment that's going to require a decision. Your kingdom, it's here. What do I do is what it's basically saying. The reality of the kingdom requires people to make a decision about their acceptance or their rejection of it. So the parable told by Jesus then describes the ramification of the kingdom. All right? So think about this. The kingdom is here. It's now. It's powerful and unstoppable. It's desirable, and you're hearing about it. And so that requires you today to make a decision about it. Am I going to accept or reject the kingdom? Am I going to live as a faithful member of that kingdom? Because, see, we have people who we call expatriates. You know, those are the people for who, whatever reason, get so upset that because they don't like what's going on, that they're going to go live somewhere else for a while. 
yeah, we're still going to claim to be Americans, and man, we got our fancy passport, but we're going to go live in Canada, or we're going to go live in England, or we're going to go do something else, and maybe we'll come back if things change, or maybe we'll live with more like-minded people somewhere else. There's not supposed to be any expatriates of the kingdom of God. We are a part of it, we are to be proud of it, and we are to live and do what it means to be members of the kingdom of God. Why wouldn't we? It's here, it's unstoppable, it's desirable. So, the kingdom is revealing. Jesus says this, starting in verse 47, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. And when the net was full, they dragged it to the shore. They sat down and they sorted the good fish into crates, but they threw the bad ones away. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the kingdom of God, then, we, what do we see? We see that it exposes those who have accepted or rejected God. So God says, here's the nature of the kingdom. And it's going to reveal who you are. The kingdom is either going to show you as somebody who is a Jesus person that has accepted God and is a part of the kingdom, or the kingdom is going to reveal that you are not of the kingdom. All right? There's no middle ground. There's no other place to go. You are a part of the kingdom or you are not a part of the kingdom. And we see this from Jesus' own words. So what impacts that result? Well, your response to the kingdom of God does. Whether you're going to choose to accept it or whether you're going to reject it. See, the parables told by Jesus describe your response to the kingdom, actually. I mean, if you go back to the very first part of Matthew chapter 13... What we see is that the kingdom of God, it's available to all of us right now. Jesus said, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and they ate it up. Others fell in the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, but because there was no depth to the soil. But when the sun had risen, it scorched them, and they became... Uh, because they had no root, and they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded some crops, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And so what we can see here is that we can see that the kingdom must be chosen. You have the decision with what you are going to do with the kingdom today. All right? It's been proclaimed. It's here. It's beneficial. It's life-changing. It's even desirable. But you are going to have to decide what you're going to do with it. See, some people will reject and resist the kingdom of God like that hard soil of the road. They refuse the seed. So some people reject the kingdom of God. It's here, and they say, nope. Some people will want to be a part of the kingdom of God as long as it doesn't require anything of them kind of like that rocky soil that initially welcomes the seed but gives up because of the adverse conditions. You know, some people do that. They get excited about the kingdom because, man, this sounds like an awesome place to be. But when they start thinking about what citizenship in the kingdom really means, they go, I don't know that I really want to do that. I think I'm going to go after something else. Not a part of the kingdom. Some people will believe that the kingdom of God and the world can equally coexist. And I'm going to tell you, the kingdom is here in the midst of the world, but there is no equality between those two. The kingdom of God is powerful and way more powerful than the kingdoms of this earth. But some people believe that they can coexist, like that seed in the midst of the thorny soil. You know, that seed starts to growing and saying, I can do this. And all the while, those thorns, they grow up. And they eventually are going to choke that out, right? Can't coexist. You've got to get rid of the thorns. And so what happens then, when you believe that you can exist equally in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of the world, what will happen is that you will get harmed. Because they don't coexist with one another. 
Lastly, though, some people will choose the kingdom of God, and they're going to benefit like the seed that produced the crop in good soil. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, we've got farmers out. You, you guys are farmers. I mean, you're happy that it rained because it's going to do stuff for your land. It's going to provide stuff for your cows to eat, or it's going to provide what is necessary so that your crops will grow. You want the good soil. You want it to produce. You sh- would make that choice for your farms each and every time. The question is, why don't we make that same choice for our lives each and every time? Why do we choose to try to coexist and get choked out and hurt? Why do we give up when things don't go exactly the way we think they ought to? Why do we refuse? Why? But here is the awesomeness of God and His kingdom for you today. Even if you've made one of those other decisions that, let's just be honest, is stupid, you're not locked into it. You can still choose to be a part of the kingdom of God. Because we all make mistakes. The Bible even tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, all right? And so even if we've messed up in the past and have rejected the kingdom to reject its citizenship, to reject its faithfulness, we can still choose today because there's still time. Now, there won't always be, but there is now. So just because you made the wrong choice doesn't mean that you can't still make the right one and be a part of the kingdom. So Jesus asked this at the end of his parables. He asked his disciples, do you understand all these things? And they said, yes, we do. He then added, every teacher of the religious law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who brings from his storeroom new gems of truth as well as old. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed. So I'm going to ask his question to you today. Do you understand the kingdom of God? If you are not part of it, you need to choose to be because it's already here. It's unstoppable. It's desirable. Why would you not want to be a part of it? God wants to take care of you from the storeroom of his goodness. I mean, that's the way he ended that, basically. He said somebody who's a part of the kingdom is like that homeowner who wants to share the bounty, the awesomeness, the coolness, the truth, his experience with other people. And so that's what we're supposed to be doing. God wants to share that with you. And if you are already a part of the kingdom, you should be actively sharing and wanting that for other people. The gospel gives us hope. His rule shows us what is best. And I know sometimes we balk at that. Really, the rule of Christ in our lives, I want to be in charge. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. But our rule doesn't always get us what's best because sometimes we do really dumb stuff. But when we allow Christ to rule, he gives us what's best. And I know that sounds tough, but man, don't you think that if God's really our father and he is really who he says he is, is he ever going to direct us or do something to us that's ever going to harm us? So why would we not want that insight? that help in that direction. His work does good, and this is what Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You want to be a part of the kingdom today? you got to be saved. If you realize today that you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, guess what? Today can be the day of salvation for you. I would love to talk with you more about how you can give your life to Christ. Man, I would spend all afternoon doing that. I'd even miss my lunch because that's how important the kingdom of God is. So, do you understand that prayer is about the kingdom of God? Jesus said what? You know, your kingdom come. 
Jesus said this, Seek ye first the kingdom above all else. Live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. Seeking first the kingdom happens through prayer. And our prayer must affirm the kingdom to which we belong. Does that make sense? So when Jesus says, your kingdom come, and we're supposed to pray that, what that means is we seek him first through prayer, and what we ask and what we think and what we listen to and what we say to God needs to reflect the nature of the kingdom, the gospel, right? You know, the fact that, that he's here for us. So, so think about this. Here's some things for you to, to kind of jot down. Are we praying for the salvation of others? The kingdom is the gospel. Remember, we talked about that. Are we praying for willingness to follow Jesus as a servant? The kingdom is the rule of Christ. There are no kings in the kingdom of God save one, and his name is Jesus. And he is our servant king, after all, because he showed us what servanthood looks like when he sacrificed everything for us on the cross. So are we willing to be a servant today? Are we willing to pray about that? Are we praying for our needs to be met by God first? Because, you know, the kingdom is the visible working of God's power. So why would we want to go anywhere else? So when we pray, your kingdom come, we're praying about these things. Are we praying for strength in the face of worldly opposition? The kingdom is here. And while the halls of politics might be able to do things that offer us rights or protect our rights, I'm here to tell you that the kingdom is accessed through prayer and God does things outside of all stuff beyond what we are able to do. So when we talk about that, the kingdom is here. God is powerful. Are we praying for the greater influence of God in society? The kingdom is unstoppable regardless of who controls the White House or the halls of Congress or whether or not people live in a government that is a constitutional republic or whether they live under the harshness of totalitarianism and communism. It's unstoppable. The kingdom is growing in North Korea. The kingdom is growing in China. The kingdom is growing where there are people who are being oppressed, who hear the hope of the good news and desire God above all else. Are we praying for faithfulness in all areas of our life? The kingdom is desirable. I should ask God, help me to be faithful because I don't want to settle for this because I have this. Are we praying for a willingness to repent as we confess our sin? Okay, believers. I mean, the kingdom is revealing, right? Sometimes we think that repent is a bad word because it shows that we were wrong. Well, sure, I mean, we're wrong in lots of stuff. But you know really what repent means is, yeah, God, I do agree that your way is better. There should be no stigma to repentance. Repentance means I'm smart enough that I chose the better way instead of staying on a sinking ship because of my pride. Think about that. Lastly, are we praying for maturity in our faith? The kingdom's available right now. Grow us. Make us who we're supposed to be. So this morning, as you bow your heads and you close your eyes, I want to beg you with everything that I've got to choose the kingdom. That if you realize you need to be saved, come forward, talk to me. Be somebody who prays about the kingdom. Your kingdom come. If you need to repent, repent. If you need someone to pray with you, I want to pray with you. Today is the day. Let's live a part of the kingdom. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for today, God. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your message. God, your kingdom come.
Matthew added, your will be done. To do the will of God means to be a part of the kingdom. Let us live a part of the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand to your feet. Our hymn of invitation is 307. Today you can join the kingdom just as you are. people of the kingdom and his kingdom is amazing and it's awesome and I want to challenge you this week to live as a part of the kingdom. Is there anything that needs to be announced before we are dismissed? Today is Karis's birthday and that is awesome and I'm, I'm happy to celebrate that with her. I also want to remind you that if you want to celebrate her birthday at the school at the benefit dinner for 4-H and for uh, uh, FFA, you can do that right after I say amen. So let's have a word of prayer and we will finish our time of worship this morning. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for today. God, we thank you that we can celebrate birth and life and God, I, I thank you for my friend Karis. And God, I thank you for everybody else that is here today as well. Uh, God, I pray that we will live as people of the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.